Hey everyone, happy Thursday and thank you for joining us on this very special live stream that we have tonight with our incredibly special guest, John Bollinger, the father of the Bollinger Bands himself, joining us tonight to talk not only about the markets, but also about how he entered the markets, how he came up with the Bollinger Bands, and, and really looking at some individual names as well. So John, it's a pleasure. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. And uh, I'm looking forward to doing this live stream with you. Oh, it's my pleasure entirely. Thanks for inviting me, Jake. Hey, you're very welcome. And before we really jump into some broad market charts and some ind individual names, I, I really wanted to kind of do a small interview, maybe 10 minutes, just you know, how did you get into the markets and how did you come up with the Bollinger Bands and in the process of looking at really standard deviations around means in the market? Well, I guess you could say I got into the markets when I was a small tyke. My grandfather um, gave me a few shares of a company called Fruhoff. Um, it was the technology play of its time. Um, it was the very beginning of containerization and Fruhoff made um, truck bodies. Um, so it, in essence, it was the technology play of its time. And from that time until, I don't know, I was a late teenager or something, the stock went from being a monster to zero. <laughs> so that, that was my introduction to the markets. Um, Love it. But in, in, a, in a more serious sense, um, uh, when I was in my late twenties, my mother was trying to retire and she would, did not trust the financial advice that she was getting. And so she suggested that, uh, um, you know, I, I should run her financial affairs for her, um, which I didn't mind doing. The fact is, is that I didn't have any idea what I was doing um, in terms of running somebody else's money. So the next couple of years were interesting. I tried all of the traditional methods, you know, fun fundamental analysis and brokerage house reports and such like that. And I, I found myself, uh, um, um, as, as I looked at the results and, and, and what was happening, I found myself um, drifting towards technical analysis. And eventually, um, I became, um, you know, almost a pure market technician, um, and uh, my results started to improve, and it's that's been my path ever since. Awesome, and and what really kind of introduced the the concept of Bollinger Bands, and and how did you even come up with, you know, this this new way of looking at kind of outliers in the market almost? So. Um, Back in the day, we used, we used trading bands. We, we kept charts by hand, of course, um, as you might imagine. Um, and um, we used trading bands. And what we did is we took, we drew a moving average on the chart, and then we used a, an, an overlay um, to shift the moving average up and down um, by some fixed percentage, um, typically, um, you know, five, seven, ten percent, something in that range. Um, mm -hmm. And that's, you know, we call those um, percentage bands today, um, but we just call them trading bands because they were the only type of trading bands we really had in those days. Um, the problem with that is when you draw those charts by hand and you, and, you, and you plot the bands for different stocks, for different indices and such like that, that the bands have to be of different width in order to make them, make them work. And what happens is that you let your emotions into the process. If you're bullish, you draw the bands in a bullish manner. And you, if you're bearish, you draw the bands in a bearish manner. Um, and, and so that's obviously not a good solution. We are looking Definitely. for a way to make bands adaptive. Um, at, the, at the time, there were um, no other adaptive bands that I knew about. And I was an option trader. I, I had started trading options pretty seriously a couple of years before. If you're an options trader, one thing you have to have is a good estimate of volatility in order to price options correctly. So I had an early microcomputer. Um, this was in, in the days before PCs and uh, an early spreadsheet program called SuperCalc. And one day I copied the formula for volatility down a column of data and notice that volatility was changing over time. Now that, that may not seem like a very enlightening moment um, today, but in those days, we, 
believed that volatility was a fixed property, like the, the building is white or, or the car is red, uh, something like that, or IBM's uh, beta is 1.2. We didn't think that it changed much over time. If the only way it changed maybe is over the life cycle of a company, a small company would have a high beta be more volatile than a mature company. Um, that proved to be totally wrong. And um, some 30 years later, the Nobel um, people gave a Nobel Prize to Robert Engels for his observation that volatility was volatile. He was looking at economic data. We were looking at, at price data. So you can see the idea was in the air. This is somehow this assumption about volatility was wrong. So after a relatively small amount of variation, I, I realized that volatility could be used to set the width of trading bands. Um, and not only could it, but that it was really, really good at doing so. Um, and that was the genesis of Bollinger Bands. And so what, what, made you, what made you choose the simple moving average 20 as the default for the, the bands themselves? It was sort of the default that we used in those days. Um, you sort of used 10, 20, and 50, where those were the, the shorter term moving averages. Uh, um, that people used. Um, you notice the zeros at the end of all of those. Um, that's because we did our calculations by hand on, on, on a pad. So for instance, to get a 10 day moving average, you just sum 10 days worth of data and cancel the last digit. And that's mm -hmm. the 10 day moving average. Um, so we had all sorts of computational shortcuts like that, um, that let us calculate indicators and, and such. So uh, in those days, you all would only keep a couple of indicators um, because otherwise you spent all your time doing calculations and none of your time trading. Hey, makes sense to me. So, so before we before we really dive into some of these individual names, let's let's jump into the broad markets and just get an idea of kind of you know using the Bollinger Bands, using the Bollinger Bands percent band as well as the uh, band width. You know, what, what are you seeing in, in the broad markets right now? So we've got the S&P 500 chart up right now, uh, SPY as the ETF or just the proxy for the S&P 500. Um, you know, how would, how would you decipher this chart and, and what are you seeing in the broad markets right now, maybe moving forward into the end of the year, looking at just the basic daily chart with, uh, with these bands? So, uh, you know, that's a great question, and it's a great moment to stop for a moment and 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 talk about what bands really do. Um, so Bollinger Bands define high and low on a relative basis. Uh, by definition, price is high at the upper band. By definition, price is low at the lower band. Um, that's what all trading bands do, whether they're Bollinger Bands, Percent Bands, Donchian, Stark, uh, Keltner, on and on and on. There are many varieties of trading bands today. They all do the same thing. They all define whether price is high or low on a relative basis. And you can use that information to find patterns. The name of the game for me, and I think for many other serious traders, is to find entry points where there's not a lot to be risked and the potential um, is greater than the amount to be risked. Um, typically, you want to see that ratio be two to one or better. Um, so if you're going to risk, say, in, in a typical trade on a stock, four or five points, then you want the potential profit to be more like, you know, 10 or 20 points. Um, so if, if you think about it for a minute, Jake, there are really only two ways, two avenues um, that you can go down to improve your performance. Um, the first one is to is what we just talked about, risking a relatively small amount for, for relatively larger gains. And the second one is to improve the, your success rate, the number of winning trades versus the number of losing trades. If you look at those two ratios, um, over time, those are the ratios that determine your ultimate results. So if you look on the left-hand side of, of this chart that you have up here, what you see there is called a W bottom. Um, on, on the, you, you have this, uh, um, yeah, right there, that's the left-hand side of the W and that's the right-hand side of the W. Um, together, they, if you, you, you can sort of see the capital letter W um, with uh, the little rally that takes you up toward the middle band um, in, in between. Yeah, that, that's the idea. 
So when you get a W like that, the first big up day after that red bar there, that's the confirmation day. And that, that's, your, that's your entry day. So if you look from there to the lower band, um, that's the amount you're risking because you make a new low, you're wrong. That's not a W. You, you, you've misinterpreted um, or misunderstood or the market's just changed its mind. Um, so that, that, that's the amount that you have to risk. And so the, the, the very first target is a trip to the upper band, as you can see, was made here. We immediately tagged the upper band. Then you, you spend a couple of days consolidating um, around, I'm sorry, the middle band. Um, you spend a couple of days consolidating around the middle band. And then you go to the second target, um, which, is, which is the upper band. And so you, you look at that relationship, that's about two and a half to one um, in terms of um, what you had to risk to where your first target is. And then you proceed to walk up the, uh, the, the upper band. So that's the sort of thing that we look for uh, uh, in, in this sort of trading approach. Um, we, we look for a low risk entry point where uh, um, we, we have a um, relatively small amount of risk and, and potentially larger gain. And we use a confirmation day. We wait for a confirmation day to improve the odds of our success. So we're dealing with both variables at the same time within a trading band framework. That's the, for, for me, the name of the game um, in trading bands. Now that works for lots of different entry techniques. We just looked at, at a W here, but there are many other um, entry techniques that, and, and exit techniques that, that one can use with trading bands. But the, the basic idea is always the same. We're looking for a place where there's relatively small amount of risk, larger potential, and the odds of our success are in our favor. Makes sense. And, and I think a lot of people maybe, you know, look at the, the upper Bollinger band when the price gets there as bearish. Now, is, is that always true? Or, or when you start to reach never that true. upper band, never true? Okay. Never true. You, so that's, you... that's the beginner's mistake for all trading bands, for whether they're Bollinger bands, whether they're Keltner bands, Donchian percent bands. Everyone wants a tag of the upper band to be a sell signal and a tag of the lower band to be a buy signal just doesn't work that way. So, you know, you've got that little orange circle uh, on there. That's a tag of the upper band, right? We actually managed to close outside of the upper band on that day. And did we go down from there? No. Should the expectation be that we go down from there? No. Um, you, you've just had, you just put in the W bottom. You, all the parts and pieces are in place. From there, you look for a rally to continue, and that's what you got. Um, so this idea that somehow um, a, a, a tag or a touch of an upper trading band is, is, is a negative event and a tag or a touch of the lower um, Bollinger, Bollinger Band or any other trading band for that matter is a positive thing um, is simply not true. Trading bands define whether price is relatively high or relatively low, and you can use that information um, in combination with other indications to develop rigorous trading systems. But um, there's nothing about a tag of the upper band or the lower band that in and of itself is a signal. I'm glad I asked this because we're getting some, uh, some comments on the chat that there, you know, some people are guilty of thinking that uh, the price getting to the upper band or the lower band is an automatic buy or sell signal. Yeah, so, you know, it's not just, they're not guilty of it. That's, you know, that, that's the simple expectation. That's what people would like, but the markets aren't simple. You know, this isn't an easy business. This is in fact a business, right? And you have to treat it like a business. Trading uh, um, is a business and and your, your trades are your inventory and you have to manage um, your inventory. So I understand that it would be really delightful um, if a tag of the upper band were, were a sell signal and a tag of the lower band were, 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 were a buy signal, but the market doesn't give money away for free, you know? It's, it, 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 it's just harder than that. I, thought that was, I understand I thought some that people, you know, in crypto have bought, you know, you know coins for, for 0. 0.00000001 and seen them go to a buck, right? Um, and they, so they 
feel that 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 it's free money. Um, but in, in you know beyond the, you know a lucky event like that, um, the market's about work and it's hard work, um, and you need discipline. I love it. Now, if we were to look at the most recent price action today, we we had a you know a decent candle here. Would your target be um, a function of the upper band, or is it is it a function of price action? If we break X high, then we our next target is the band. How do you kind of look at the current price action and in, in in relation to the bands and uh, and kind of get a thesis on what's maybe to come next? I don't. I love it. I love it. So, so I'm, I'm sorry, but you know what, 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 what we're doing here is we've, we've just had a pretty good rally. Um, we've separated from the upper band, pulled back a little bit and are, are, are trying to make a new high. Um, so we're in a consolidation mode. You can see that consolidation mode by looking down the screen at that bottom indicator. That's bandwidth. We'll talk about that in, in, in a couple of minutes, but that bandwidth de declining like that means that the bands are tightening. They're, 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 they're coming together, which is what you typically see in a consolidation. So in this particular moment, there's nothing to do from a Bollinger Band perspective, but wait for a couple more bars to see how the price structure develops and see whether um, it's we're in, accumul in accumulation phase, which I do think we are, um, but or distribution phase. Um, right now, we're really on the knife edge there um, for, 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 for the broad market. For, this is SPY, you said? Yes, this is SPY. Yeah. I, I can't see the price scales or anything like that on, on my screen. So a um, uh, little hard for me to tell, but so, so we're really, we're, it's not that we're in limbo. It's just that we're in process and we're looking for a sell signal. Now if we break down from here, you know, then we'll have sort of a sloppy top and that's the nature of, of trading sloppy tops versus better defined bottoms. Bottoms are set by the emotion fear. Fear is an urgent, painful mo emotion that, that, that causes you to act to end the pain. Tops, on the other hand, are completely different psychologically. They're big, soft affairs. You know, everybody's, you know, maybe you're afraid that it's a top, but really, you know, you, you, you just made some money and you're feeling good. And everything's okay. And, and, you know, it, it just takes longer for a top to develop and they're less clearly delineated, they're sloppier. For example, we, we talk about W bottoms, very sharply defined pattern, right? But for tops, the pattern you more often see is called three pushes to a high. You know, it's a more complex pattern that develops over a longer time. Uh, and, you know, maybe there's a little bit of that there now, it's not clearly defined yet. Um, but um, if you look, uh, about a third of the way fr from the right-hand side of the screen, you see there's a red candle there. Yeah, so that, you go back one bar, there's a black bar um, right, right before it. Um, that's maybe the first push. Um, then you, I, I think you can be able to pick out the second push pretty easily. Um, all right, no, no, for, for, yeah, there you go. There, there's yep. your second push. and. We may be in the middle of a third push, but we need confirmation and that hasn't shown up yet. So it's just opinion now. It's not a fact that you want to act on. Mm -hmm. And what, what would your definition of confirmation be? Would it be a break of a previous high or what, what would that look like? Big ugly candle, um, negative price action uh, uh, of, uh, of some sort, um, support breaking, a moving average breaking could be any number of things, but it, it, it has to be evidence, negative evidence. And, and we just don't see that yet. Yeah, makes sense. Well, uh, we got about five more minutes to check out some more broad market names. The Qs are another one that had a pretty good day. We actually hit new all time highs today. What, you know, are you, are you thinking kind of, ha have we gotten past that confirmation where we were breaking this previous high or do we still have uh, some some uh, price action to prove that we're we're kind of on the next leg up. Well, this is obviously a more constructive chart than the last one. We have more upward price action recently, and as you pointed out, they ticked a new uh, new high today. The thing with the with the Qs, um, we call them the cubes, but um, 
Uh, that's another story. Um, the thing with the cubes is that um, if you look at the underlying um, statistics, it's really a mess. Um, so you've got just a very few stocks driving this to a new high. Um, we all know the names. Um, they're your Apples and your Amazons and your NVIDIAs. And, you know, it's just a, it's a list of a dozen names that's, that's lifting this. And the rest of the list is doing really pretty poorly. If you look at the NASDAQ composite itself, the big NASDAQ index actually have more new lows, more 52 week new lows than new highs here. And that's very dangerous uh, to see an index go up um, with that sort of internal deterioration. So um, I, I, I find this pattern pretty constructive here. Um, it, it's a pretty normal pattern um, for, for trading, um, but I'm on alert. I'm, I'm looking for reasons to be negative. I'm not seeing them yet, but I'm on alert because of the interior, internal deterioration inside the market. You know, each week I produce a market timing chart pack. Um, it's got 40 charts in it. They're all broad market charts of various types. We cover everything from international indexes to, to the S&P, the Dow, uh, uh, various uh, Russell indexes and stuff like that. And I make it available for free. You can get it on my website, bollingerbands.com. Usually it's published on Saturdays. Most of the time it's published sometime over the weekend. If you just scroll down to the bottom of the, of the homepage of bollingerbands.com, there's, there's a link for it. And there's another link for the documentation that goes, goes with it. It's my way of giving back to the marketplace a, a little bit. I love it. And um, one one quick question there was in the chat. Anytime you guys see me looking down, I'm just looking at my phone right in front of me. Um, what is and and you know what is the difference between the average true range and the Bollinger Band? Well, there's a loaded question. If I've ever ever seen one, I will buy that person an IPA immediately. Thank you. <laughs> So we just, you, just, you just opened the door for the history of trading bands. So let's see. Uh, let's see. I've got a bookcase behind me. Somewhere on this bookcase is Chesner Keltner's book. I can't find it right now, but it's, 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 it's back there. It's called How to Make Money in Commodities. It was published in 1960. And, you know, someplace about a quarter of the way into the book, he proposed a commodity trading system called the 10 day rule. And mm -hmm. that is the the origin of sort of modern adaptive trading bands. It was not presented as trading bands in any way whatsoever. It wasn't even really um, it was a commodity trading system that was always in the market. And he suggested that you keep a 10 day moving average and that you have a point uh, um, above that 10-day moving average, um, which would be one 10-day range, not average to range or anything like that, but the 10-day uh, uh, average range. They didn't know about uh, true range back in those days. Um, and a point um, below that, um, that would one average range down, also 10-day average range. So if you crossed above the upper point, you went long that commodity. And then you stayed long that commodity until you crossed below the lower point, mm -hmm. right? And you there, you sold, you sold two. You reversed from your long position by selling one and entered a short position by selling two. So it was always in the market commodity trading system. That, that, and so that idea, that trading system was lifted out of that book um, by um, some traders in Chicago in the 70s. Um, and from that, they created what we now know as Keltner bands. Kel Chester Keltner himself never created a trading band. He, he, uh, he, it just wasn't something he did, but it was, it was done by other people in, in Chicago, uh, maybe 10 years, 10, maybe between 10 and 15 years later. I've never actually um, 
found out um, who did it. It was supposedly a private trader. Um, you know, it's like so many things in, in the stock market because people don't publish their ideas. It's very hard to understand um, exactly who the credit should go to. Um, so that was, that became sort of the first adaptive um, trading um, band. The second one um, of a similar vintage was created by a, a very famous guy by the name of Donchian. We call these Donchian bands, and these were the trading bands that the turtle traders use. Those have a, a similar uh, 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 simple definition. Um, they are the upper band is the highest high from the past n days, and the lower band is the lowest low from the past n days. Um, mm -hmm. And um, you're always one day behind, so you can, you know, you know that if today you closed above yesterday's band high, that's that's a, a buy signal. And again, if you close below yesterday's band low, that's a sell signal. So the, both of those were actually trading systems, not uh, on trading bands so much. But today we chart them and they've become trading bands. Um, so um, the question is about average true range versus um, standard deviation, which is what Bollinger Bands use. And it's, so if you look inside the calculation for standard deviation, there's a little bit of magic, a little bit of math, mathematical magic. And that is um, the way you calculate standard deviation is you, you take an average and you calculate the distance from that average to all the other data points in the window that, that the, the average was used. Then the, and that's, that, that's the raw data. But if you sum that data, that data collapses to zero, right? Because some of them are gonna be above the average, some of them are gonna be below the average. So the, how do you avoid that? You square those values and that's the magic. Because if you square a small number, you get another small number. But if you square a big number, you get a really big number out of the calculation. So that means as you start to gap away from, from the average, the bands will expand dramatically to keep, in, keep your definition of relatively high and relatively low germane to the price structure. So the magic of Bollinger Bands, if there's any magic whatsoever, is this squaring process that goes on inside of standard deviation. The mathematical name for standard deviation is root mean squared deviation, right? It's that squared deviation that makes Bollinger Bands work. That's that's the name of the game. So I love it. One IPA to the question asker. Uh, who was that? Who gets an IPA? Who is that? All right. Whoever asked the question, post in the chat. One IPA to you. All right. One more Bitcoin. Um, I'm not sure how much you use Bitcoin as a proxy for liquidity in the market. Um, but, you know, it does seem like you do have a pretty interesting correlation when you do have Bitcoin moving down, the markets uh, having trouble. But it's interesting because SPY and the Qs did pretty well today with Bitcoin tanking, but IWM, which definitely is a little more um, a risk on, risk off sentiment indicator in, in index, uh, did have some trouble today. So uh, what are you thinking about Bitcoin? How do you use Bitcoin as an overall risk on, risk off indicator in the broad markets? So when I started with uh, with cryptos, I started with Bitcoin, uh, obviously, because that was the name of the game then. Um, there were some other coins, but Bitcoin was the one. Um, and it was it was a technical analysis heaven, right? Because it wasn't correlated to anything else. There weren't a lot of there weren't a lot of professionals trading it. There was virtually no arbitrage. There was there, there was no program trading going on. All you had was pure supply and demand on display. And it was really, really a delightful time. Over the years, that has really changed. Uh, Bitcoin has, as you point out, has really become a, just another risk on, risk off sort of asset. I don't really see it as leading the risk on, risk off parade, but I do see it as very sensitive to the risk on, risk off parade. You see, as, as you saw today, um, smaller stocks were pressured um, today and along, along with Bitcoin. Um, and I think that that's really um, 
um, an indication of underlying fear in the marketplace. So if you look over on the left-hand side of this chart, I'm sure that your sharp eyes will be able to pick out a W bottom in Bitcoin. Um, and you can see that it's time to talk about the two indicators um, that are in the clips beneath um, there. So the one that has the blue channel running through the middle of it, we call that percent B. Um, and that tells us where we are in relation to the Bollinger Bands. When we're at the bottom of that channel, price is at the lower band. When we're at the top of that channel, price is at the upper band. We're outside of that channel, um, then price is above the upper band. When we're underneath that channel, price is below the lower band. So you see those two circles that you highlighted on, um, on price? Um, mm -hmm. Notice that on the fir first circle, um, that um, percent B was a negative number. It means we were outside of the lower band. Um, mm -hmm. And then the second circle, um, which is the second circle that you've drawn from the right, um, percent B is much, much higher than it was on the first circle, even though price is nearly identical. And so that's the definition of a W bottom in terms of Bollinger Bands. It's a new low in price that's not a new low relative to Bollinger Bands, right? Makes so we sense. use that. We use that W to forecast a, a, a rally in Bitcoin. We, we got a, a, a big rally out of there. Um, then, um, you know, we got, that, we got that little top formation there um, and we've gone sideways ever since. And now we're getting a little sell off to break out the bottom of the trading range. I actually suspect that we're gonna see a reversal here um, and see some positive price action. Um, but we're waiting for that. It hasn't happened yet. So we're on alert, but um, um, it's, it's not happened yet. How much, how much weight do you put on the Bollinger Band, the lower or the upper band moving up or down? So for example, right now, the lower band is, is decreasing and, and starting to move down. Does that have any weight when you're looking at possibly a reversal or is that just a function of the price action creating that band starting to decrease? So I have a good friend uh, in Paris by the name of Philippe Kahn. Uh, he, he tutors uh, um, people in, in, in trading and, and such like that. And he's done a huge amount of analysis of, uh, of the direction of the bands. And, and he's talked a, a, a lot about um, various ideas. One idea that I really like you can see on, on the chart, that circle you've drawn on the, on the, on the upper band there, um, from there, notice both bands are run parallel to one another in, in, in what he calls a parallel, right? And that that parallel ends when the top is put in um, in, in the Bollinger Bands um, there um, the, where you see that big red down candle. So that parallel, when, when things are trending strongly, they will march up the upper band in a parallel like that, or they will march down the lower Bollinger Band in a, in a similar par parallel form formulation. So that's always very helpful. And after you've seen that, you, after you've seen a rally like that, when the upper band turns down or flattens out, that usually marks the end of that rally. And you, you see that there. So um, that's one aspect of, of those, um, Bands. So what we see here, the average is turned down um, a couple of days ago, but what's really happening is volatility is expanding to drive that, that lower band down. You can see that from the bottom indicator, which is bandwidth, which tells us how wide the trading bands are. Um, so if you look at the trough in, in, in bandwidth there, um, say um, 15 trading days ago where it was at a very low value that's called a squeeze um, mm -hmm. and um, that circle that you've made in price structure right after the squeeze that's called a head fake um, and um, that is a very negative indication um, and that's what that was that that's what led to the current decline interesting so, so is this something that you see during 
while the price action is forming or is this kind of like after the daily candle on November 9th formed this this all time high kind of flip here? Well, you, you, you know, you know, you know, armchair quarterbacking is always easier, you know. <laughs> I, mean, come on. I mean, if you see the results, I mean, you know what to look for. But no, these are rules that we've we, we've talked about forever that many traders um, look at and follow. Um, these are very clear cut setups um, that you know when when you see a formation like that at the upper band after a squeeze, you you you. You, you strongly suspect that there's going to be negative results out of it. Interesting. So, and okay. I say strongly suspect because that's what it is. There's no certainty here, right? The odds, we're always talking about the odds, right? So that you see a setup like that, the odds for a decline are high. That's a much better way to put it. Um, people want, you know, certainty in, in the trading business. And, you know, at least I, I've never found any certainty makes sense now um so we went over some of the uh you know the ways that you look at the bollinger bands the percent b the 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 band width let's jump into some of the things that you like about trend spider so one of the things that you really mentioned that you like are the raindrops uh as well as the multi time frame analysis so before we we really jump into the raindrops and look at a couple of case studies on raindrops and using you know bollinger bands with raindrops you know, let's just quickly jump into what is a raindrop candle. Excellent. So a raindrop chart uh, is really a volume weighted chart. So it, it allows you to see the volume profile within, within the day's range, within the candles range, whether that's a day, a month, uh, a week. So, so this is something that John and I really talked about when we first started to chat and really started to explore TrendSpider and, and show him around. And, and for those that are not familiar, I'm sure many of you are, this is what a raindrop is. It, it allows you to see the volume weighted candle, uh, a volume weighted candle. Instead of the open and the close, you're looking at the volume weighted average price for the first and the second half of the candle. So uh, that's the first layer. Second layer is being able to see the volume profile within, within that candle. And so, um, you know, other than what I just said, you know, what really intrigued you about the raindrop, uh, John? So, it, you know, we were born with a really powerful pattern recognition engine, um, one that, that, that goes all the way back to, um, you know, man's early days when, you um, being able to sort out the tiger in the jungle um, from the background uh, was the difference between living and dying. Um, and anything that we can do that improves our ability to recognize patterns, I think is really terrific. When I started the business, we used bar charts. It's just a vertical line um, connecting the high and low for that time period with a, a tick off to the left for the opening price and a tick off to the right for a closing price um, if you were fancy. But many people just use this, this simple little um, the simple little, little line. The, the, the first enlightenment came um, when I was, I don't know, I'd been in the business five or six years and um, a guy in Chicago um, went um, to Japan and saw candlesticks and um, took a book written by a Japanese commodity analyst by the name of Shaki Shimuzu and had it translated um, and printed, reprinted in, in America. And he sold them um, um, to, to traders on a one-off one basis. Um, uh, I probably... I was going to say you got a whole library back there. Yeah, yeah, it's it's in here somewhere. I don't. Yeah, hard, hard to find by looking over the shoulder, but um. So 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 we saw candlesticks for the first time, and that was enlightenment because they 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 highlighted the relationship of the open and the close, which bar charts, although the information was there, it was not as clear, right? So a, a lot of us switched to using candlestick charts. 
um, because it gave us a, our pattern recognition engines a little more information, made it a little easier to, to, to trade. Uh, then I said, well, you know, ah, I didn't, I never liked the fact with candlesticks that the, the wicks were so thin in relation to, to, to the body. I just, I thought it de-emphasized the importance of the high and low while overemphasizing the importance of the relationship of the open and close. So I created Bollinger bars, um, which, which I switched to, and I still use for almost all of my charting. Um, it's simply a, a a, a very wide candlestick. The, the whole bar is the width of the central portion of the candlestick, the body of the candlestick. Um, and the, the, the body of the candlestick is filled in red if the close is lower than the open and green if the close is higher than the open. And, and the wicks, the portion that would have been the wicks are filled in, in, in a medium blue. And that, that for me really made trading much, much easier combining um, those candlesticks. So, you know, when you first contacted me and asked me to take a look at 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 at, um, at, at these um, raindrops, I immediately liked them because they they added another dimension. They they added this the the, the volume at price function, um, which I really liked, um, and I loved that you split the the time period in half with the, the volume at price uh, on the left-hand side um, uh, for the first half of the bar and, and the volume price on, on the, the um, right-hand so, side of the bar for the second. And I also loved, liked your coloring scheme using the VWAP um, for the left-hand side of the bar um, versus the VWAP on the right-hand side of the bar. That's volume weighted average price. Um, for those who don't know what VWAP is, to color the bar. So if the VWAP in the second half of the session, the volume weighted average price in the second half of the session is, is, uh, is, is higher, the bar will be colored green. So I, I thought it, it, it was an, uh, a, a value added way of, of looking at price. And, and I was immediately charmed by it. Um, I'll probably... Um, uh, uh, yeah, I like them a lot. Is all, all, all I can say. I think I think it makes the, the process of um, of identifying patterns in, in relation to bands much easier. Well, our our goal is to make it more efficient. So you know, hopefully, you know, hopefully, instead of having to go to the one minute or the two minute chart during the daily time frame, you know, you can see all that price action and volume uh, within the daily chart. So we have ACN here. Uh, we, we are kind of running short on time, so I want to try to get as, as many of these um, examples in as possible. I know you wanted to look at ACN. What's, what's grabbing your eye about ACN when you're looking at the raindrops and the, and the Bollinger Bands as well as the lower indicators as well? So I didn't want to look at this for the raindrops in, in specific, although there are some good raindrop examples here. But if you, you, you squeeze that in, so there's, there's a bunch more bars. So we can see, you know, may, maybe nine months worth of action or, or, or so. Yeah, there we go. So uh, a little bit less there. there that, that's perfect. My point here um, was um, this... My, my point with this chart was to address the idea that price can and does walk up the upper band. And it does so really strong stocks can and will walk up the upper band. They will contact the upper band time and time and time and time again. And that all of those touches of the upper band are in fact not sell signals. If you want a sell signal in a stock like this, you're going to have to bring some other kind of analysis to it because these really strong long-term high relative strength, high momentum stocks are capable of, of you know, just, just walking right up that, that upper band. And you can even see uh, uh, um, there, there's a couple little times on this chart where you can see capable of walking down the lower band as, as well. So my, my point here is that this isn't uh, um, this, you know, was to try to put put a lie to this idea that a tag of the upper band was a sell signal and a, that a tag of the lower band was what was a bicycle by showing, you know, one of these really, really strong stocks that, you know, if you'd used all those tags as, as sell signals, you would have been really, really unhappy.
You can zoom out if you want to uh, talk again uh, about some of the raindrops. I, I did see a couple of raindrop patterns uh, in there that I thought were interesting. Yeah, sorry, sorry, I was on mute. But yeah, no, I mean, this is this is pretty uh, classic stair step action to the upside. So um, I'm glad I'm glad you brought that up because I think there is a big fallacy in the market about you know you sell the upper band, you buy the lower band, and and thank you for confirming that because we have well, had you, a few people. You, you, you know, you can do that with the right asset in the right market. If you got something that that that's in a non-trending mode and has a lot of volatility, you can do that. Right, you can sell setups, not single bar touches, but you can sell setups at the upper band and 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 buy setups at at, at the lower band, um, time and time and time again. But it's got to be the right time and the right asset to pull off that sort of thing. It's not a universal idea. Makes sense. And the next one is uh, Tesla. This has been an interesting one, and I think probably one of the better case studies on raindrops we've had uh, over the last you know, a week or two where you have this diagonal resistance and you, you had what's called a balloon raindrop. You just have a lot of volume at the top of the range. And you can see that you've got buyers absorbing that supply above this resistance zones. So for, for the way you're looking at Tesla, obviously the bands are, you know, starting to contract a little bit. Price is starting to consolidate. Uh, with you just quickly looking at this chart, you know, what, what, uh, kind of strikes your eye is is this something that you kind of just wait to see do we break above or below the sma 20 how, how do you kind of decipher this chart when you're looking at the bands but also you know maybe taking into the raindrops uh, into account a little bit so the feature i like on this chart is the two bar reversal at the middle band um that's that that led to this consolidation consolidation this is why i like the raindrop charts because you can see um you know the red the red raindrop um has all, almost all of its volume in the lower half of the trading range both in the morning and in the afternoon and that's exactly reversed the next day um so i, I call those two bar reversals um and i really love them i think they're um when they're big fat reversals like that where the 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 ranges are, are you know, greater than average true range. Um, I, I think they're very significant. I think uh, they, these raindrops uh, um, help you see that. Obviously, you can see that on 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 a on a regular bar chart as well. But I I, I think this lends a clarity to it that that's really useful. This seems like actually a pretty positive pattern to me. Um, you know, we 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 come we made a, a little consolidation here. We tried to take it down. Um, four four sessions ago and, and failed at that. A um, little bit of churning. Rumor is that he's been a very active seller of this stock, uh, selling billions of dollars worth of this stock, and the market's been able to absorb it. Mm -hmm. So uh, yeah, that's actually, for that's for sure. This actually looks pretty constructive to me, unless we start to to demonstrate some some negative action uh, um, here, which we're not at this stage of the game. Um, you know, I, I would see this as a pretty constructive chart. So we just had a question. I, I already know the answer, but I, I want to make sure that those that are watching, when the percent, or excuse me, when the bandwidth is decreasing, that is not a sell signal, correct? Well, it could be as part of a bigger setup, like a, um, as part of a, a, a topping formation, uh, often bandwidth will turn down in the midst of a topping formation. And that's a, a piece of evidence to use in that, but there's nothing about a turn down and bandwidth in and of itself that's a sell signal. Makes sense. So so let's let's jump into another part of trend splatter that you really like. And that's and that's something that I remember I tried to show you a lot before we finally got in touch and started chatting. And that's the multi-time frame analysis, really the ability to see uh, a Bollinger Band, let's say uh, a weekly Bollinger Band on a daily chart. So I know we had a couple tickers that we wanted to look over. Um, let's look at GSK, uh, GlaxoSmithKline. That's one that you you uh, wanted to check out. And and what and what with GSK is is what is really kind of catching your eye. So I'm going to turn on the daily width and the daily bands, and then I'll turn on the actual weekly. Bollinger Bands here. Uh, 
what's interesting is you've got a couple times where we did actually have that that break of the the upper band on the weekly chart on the daily side of things and, and you did have a reversal is there any difference between being on the same time frame let's say the daily candle breaking the daily bollinger band versus the daily candle breaking a longer term time frame so this goes back to how we kept charts in the old days by hand um you know we would keep basically two kinds of charts yeah. Some crazy people like myself kept short-term charts, but most of us um, um, kept daily and weekly charts. Um, but um, you, you know, you've got a lot of paper charts and you've got a lot of stuff going on. So what we would do is we would take the information off the weekly chart and plot it on the daily chart. Um, so even though you'd only have a data point every five, every five trading sessions, um, it gave you a longer-term reference for. Um, for um, what you're working, what you're working with, uh, the the stock or or in index or whatever. Once you um, turn both on, both the 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 twenty day and the and the weekly. Yeah, there you go. So, um, you know, this 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 is just sort of an effortless version of what we used to spend a lot of time and effort and energy doing. So let's just look at one uh, uh, one trade here, um, give you an idea. Um, so we're going to look. Um, if you look down at bandwidth on the toward toward the right hand side of the screen, there's a big trough in bandwidth where it's the values are very very low. Um, you know, low. Yeah, there. Um, so that's a squeeze. That that that's a trough in in bandwidth. And notice what's happening here, right? That, that, that you have support coming into the squeeze at both the lower daily Bollinger Band and the lower weekly Bollinger Band. And I just love that sort of thing when you have this confluence of indicators. We call this in, in the business a logical place. Um, often it's defined by, by price, of a prior high or prior low, prior consolidation range, so, some, something like that. But they can be defined by indicators that, like this as well. So this is a logical place. And, and um, you see the rally coming out of the, of the squeeze that carries prices pretty dramatically higher here. Um, a squeeze is an anticipation of, of higher volatility. So it, it just combining this daily and weekly analysis just gives you a little bit more edge. Um, than you might have had otherwise. And, and I really like that. Um, it's the, yours is the first platform that I've, I've seen that made it um, easy to do this. One, one question I have. So when you're looking at these troughs on the Bollinger Band width, do you have a threshold? So I, I'm seeing that the Y axis is one to about seven, what I'm looking at here. Is there a threshold of like a low bandwidth? So like below two or, or is it relative to whatever stock you're looking at? It, it, well, it's going to be different for every stock. Some stocks are going to have a, a bandwidth range of, of say two to 15. Some will have a bandwidth range of 10 to 50. I mean, they're, they're, yep. they're, different stocks have completely different volatility characteristics. So bandwidth is going to be different for them. So I, I always look at them in, in terms of time. I look back okay. and, and see the prior troughs and see see for that individual item where those troughs were made, prior peaks where those peaks were made, um, get some sense of what's high and low for bandwidth for that individual item. Got it. So it's it's really all relative. It's kind of based on the personality of the stock, essentially. It everything is relative. That that that's we live. Uh, traders live in, in a relative world. There are no absolutes. I know that lots of people would love to have absolutes. And, and if you go over on Twitter and there are people promising you absolutes right and left, join my group and bang, we'll give you the, we'll give you the truth. <laughs> An absolute man. Well, you know, we all know that's not going to happen. You know, there's no Santa Claus either. I, I, I yep. hope, I'm, hope I'm not what? just kidding you. <laughs> oh, no. Yeah. So, so, you know, for some I'm people who are looking at, 
Santas are in short supply this year, uh, um, they, they say. So there actually may be no Santa this year. Yeah, you, you never know. They, uh, he could be stuck in a cargo ship on the, uh, the, the, west, uh, the west coast somewhere around LA. Yeah. So, so, so bandwidths, bandwidths are not oscillators is what you're saying. They're not, they're not oscillating between two and five. They're, it's completely a function of, of really the um, personality in each stock, as you mentioned. Now, let's go to another everything, one. You, you every, do everything, do... I, everything I do is relative. And I think that's really, really important to, to, to understand. Remember my definition of, Bol of Bollinger Bands. Bollinger Bands define whether price is high or low on a relative basis. That's the core of everything I do. I love it. Now, you do use these on Forex as well. Do you do you trade Forex actively or do you just use it as a, a proxy for maybe some other variables in the market? So I, I put this, I, I put a Forex item on here because I just wanted to make a point, uh, um, an odd point that I think most people haven't thought about, but it's really important. Forex trading is pairs trading. You're, you're, you're long one currency, short the other currency, right? It's like Bitcoin trading is pairs trading um, um, or tra trading something like Ether is, is usually pairs trading. You're, you're you know, long Bitcoin, short Ether or, or long Ether, short, short Bitcoin, that sort of thing. All of those are pairs, uh, long Apple, short IBM. Um, you know, they're, they're all pairs um, and pairs have a unique characteristic. They are what is known in the statistical world as stationary. Um, they have this property, the, the actual name of it is stationarity. Um, and that means that for pairs, tops and bottoms are the same. For stocks or indexes and stuff like that, tops and bottoms are not the same. We talked before about fear and greed um, in, in, in and, and fear delineating bottoms in the stock market much more clearly. Um, but um, uh, in pairs, they're mirrors, right? Tops form the same way the bottoms form. Um, so you need to have a different mindset, different trading mindset when you're working with things that are pairs than when you're working with things that are freestanding assets like a, the stock of a a major U.S. corporation or such. Makes sense. And, and is there a particular reason you watch the GBP, JPY pair over maybe a, a different pair? Easy to trade. Okay. So do you, so, so do you. It's a nice liquid pair. They do, they do, you know, they do a lot of, uh, um, they, they do a lot of dollar volume in it every day. And uh, I mean, there are some pairs that people trade that, you know, trade by appointment only. I have no interest in those whatsoever. I want to, you know, something that's nice and liquid and, and with a lot of interest on both sides of the equation. Um, so this just happens to be one I picked it more or less at random. No, Makes that's sense. not true. I didn't pick it at, at random. I, I, I actually followed this pair. But I mean, I didn't, I didn't pick it because it's special or something like that. Do you use the, um, the Bollinger Bands any different across different markets? So Forex, crypto, well, that's, stocks? That's what I was, that's what I was trying to, to, hit, to, to, to hint at. Bollinger Bands for pairs um, are different than Bollinger Bands for freestanding assets, right? The, the price action is more symmetrical. Yeah, I, 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 I'm seeing kind of like a couple of times where you do have a pretty predictable bottom on some of these lower band touches and, and that type of thing. But then, you know, as soon as you think you've got it, then all of a sudden you hit the upper band and you just continue to move up. So uh, it's, it's interesting to see that, you know, this, uh, this particular pair, you know, has, has some different ways that it's respecting these bands a little more than what you'd find in, in stocks. Um, so by, but, so by, but by now you ought to be able to see the difference between those two things that you just pointed out. The, the, the bottoms that you pointed to all have patterns to them. And the top where we tag the upper band has no cell pattern to it. Yep. And do you, do you do any back testing of bands or do you just kind of, as the price action 
evolves, do you just take it as it is? Or do you look at a specific ticker or pair and say, okay, well, this has a better chance of bouncing off the lower band or the upper band, or do, does that not matter? Well, we do do testing. I mean, yeah, we're, 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 we're computer friendly here. You know, we use the tools that are available. <laughs> I, I mean, I, I don't mean to be, I don't mean to be sassy about that, but you know, um, yeah, of course. Yeah, we okay. want, we want to, you know, but we, we, and this is probably a, a great closing comment. Um, uh, we really believe in first principles, the the basic operating mechanisms of the of the market. People always ask me the question, how come Bollinger Bands still work? How come they haven't been arbitraged away? They're so popular. They're on all the software. You can see them everywhere. And the answer to that is pretty straightforward. Um, it's because they touch a first principle of the market and they're not gonna break unless the market breaks, all right? If you change, you physically change the structure of the market, then Bollinger Bands will physically change. But Bollinger Bands are based on a first principle of the market, and that that's volatility, brute mean squared volatility specifically. So they're robust, they're good. The other thing they are is something that they are not. They're not a system, right? So they're a tool, um, and everybody uses them in different ways. Um, so if they if it were a simple system with a simple set of rules they would have it, the usefulness of bollinger bands percent b and bandwidth would have been arbitraged away long 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 ago but they're not they're just a set of tools that define price whether price is high or low on a relative basis and what you do with those definitions is the key not the definitions themselves I love it. Last question before we, we head out. I want to respect your time. We're, we're right at an hour. Do you have a preference? Do you use log scale over linear scale when using the Bollinger Bands? Does that, does that mess up the chart at all or does it, does it really matter at all? So I like semi-log scaling, which is to say log scaling on the price scale and, and normal scaling on the, on the time axis. Um, I like log scaling. The problem that people have with it is that uh, especially for low priced items um, and in volatile times, the lower band can be driven below zero. Um, um, and that plots terribly on, 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 on log scaling. Um, so for normal things, you know, like, you know, things that are priced normally, um, then um, log scaling is just fine. Um, for very low priced things um, that have a, Good bit of volatility to them. Um, log scaling um, produces, yeah. They, there you go. <laughs> produces some 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 dramatically ugly looking charts. And since we're in the business of trying to produce things that are pleasing to look at that help our pattern recognition engine work, you want to avoid things like this. Make makes complete sense. Well, John, complete complete true honor for me to be able to interview you and, and talk about the markets with you tonight. And thank you everybody for joining in this special live stream on Thursday. Uh, looks like Bitcoin is, is really starting to move down even while we've been on the live stream. So we'll see how this plays out. But John, thank you so much. For those that want to learn more about John and uh, his, uh, his website, John, can you give us a little more information where people can find you? Easiest way is to come to my website, BollingerBands.com. We also have an analytics website where you, with Bollinger Band charting for um, most of the world's indexes and, and stocks. Um, that's BollingerBands.us. And if you want that, if you want my weekly chart pack, my market timing chart pack, you can find that at the bottom of the homepage of BollingerBands.com. And of Fantastic. course, you can find me on Twitter, you know, at and what, what is your handle? Yes. It's B, B bands and you have a number after it? No, no, the, the numbers are the scammers. Numbers are the scammers. That's what they do is they add a couple extra little, little twits. My handle on, on Twitter is at sign B, B, A, N, D, S. And typically what the, the scammers do is they rip off my picture and they rip off our logo and all of that stuff. And they go at B bands one or at un, B band, un, underscore or something like that, or two S's or, or, or something like that. 
to to try to rip people off. I promise you this, and this is really important. I will never ask you for money. So if somebody's pretending to be me and asking you for money, you know it's a scam. You heard it from the man himself, everybody. At bbands on Twitter, uh, BollingerBands.com, correct? Yep. BollingerBands.com for the website. And um, and yeah, John, it was a pleasure. I hope to have you on again soon to maybe see where the markets are in six months to eight months to a year. And um, as I mentioned, it's it's – Bollinger Bands are something that I used early on, and it's just, it's really an honor to have you on and chatting with me. So thank you so much for your time. And for those that are looking for the next episode that we have coming on on Transpire TV, we've got PB Investing with Dan on our first Talking with Traders. That's on Tuesday at 9 p.m. Eastern. So make sure to check that out on Tuesday. I hope everybody has a great holiday for those that uh, celebrate Thanksgiving. And if not, I uh, hope you have a great week ahead and a great rest of the week uh, ending tomorrow. And John, thank you again so much for your time tonight. My pleasure entirely. See you, everyone. Have a good night. Okay.